So I would like to introduce our last speaker, Amy Desmaris, is a person living with idiopathic hypersomnia. She is also one of the uh, staff members of the Hypersomnia Foundation and is a longtime supporter and volunteer within the community. She also currently serves as the organization's treasurer, or other, in other words, chief financial officer. So welcome, Amy. She's going to talk on living with idiopathic hypersomnia. Okay. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm from Danvers, Massachusetts. Thank you for this invitation. I'm excited to share my journey with idiopathic hypersomnia today. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, and there's also a brief audience survey to complete. Growing up, my parents encouraged me to try everything. I was a Girl Scout, played soccer, a gymnast, I played clarinet in marching band. The photo on the left is my high school marching band in the Rose Bowl Parade in Pasadena, California in 2006. It was the first time it rained on the parade in 51 years. <laughs> I was on the math team, ski club, and was a cheerleader for 13 years. And the photo on the right is of some of the girls from the Stonehill College cheer squad stunting on the beach in Daytona, Florida before the National Cheerleading Association competition in 2008. That's me up in the air there. I was also an honor student, earning the nickname A plus Amy. <laughs> I don't know exactly when my symptoms started, but my parents have always said that I was a good baby. I was generally happy, always slept through the night, and could go down for a nap on cue. I got this photo back in the mail from a time capsule for my 10-year high school reunion. It seems I've been a sleepyhead for as long as I can remember. As I got older, I developed some habits, like sleeping in a sleeping bag on top of my bed so that I didn't have to make it in the morning, and even you know, sleeping in my jeans so that I could maximize my time in bed. Everyone in my life just thought I was sleepy because I was so active and that these habits were creative solutions. I was such a high achiever that people just didn't worry about me. And it's unclear whether my condition worsened or was just more noticeable transitioning from childhood to adulthood, but it seemed to have a greater effect on my life as time went on. I also got mono in high school, a concussion in college, and had recurring strep throat leading to getting my tonsils removed at 21 years old. And I mention these things because they've all been kind of tossed around as theories for potential causes or triggers. This photo is from my senior year of college at Stonehill when I was 21 years old. When I was a cheerleader, I had to find ways to fall asleep sitting up and get some naps in. If you've ever been involved in competitive sports, you understand. On this day, I somehow woke up at 6 a.m. for hair and makeup, and then had a two-hour drive to the competition, which lasted from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., followed by the two-hour drive home. If you couldn't tell, I'm the one in the middle there, sleeping, sitting up on the couch, leaning forward with the pillow on my lap. We were in our coach's small living room, filled with more than 20 girls, with loud conversations and music playing in order to get us excited for the competition. At the time, everyone just thought it was funny or even lucky that I had the ability to fall asleep anywhere. But it was more than just feeling tired. It felt like someone nailed something heavy to my face between my eyebrows, and in order to open my eyes, I had to lift it with my eyelids. It was nearly impossible to fight it or overcome it, so I would always find a way to nap. My teammate captioned the photo, Amy falls asleep, sitting up, loving the curls. And I still stand by my comment there. I couldn't crush my curls by actually laying down. We ended up coming in first place at the competition, too. I studied accounting in college, and becoming a certified public accountant, or CPA, was my goal at this point. In order to become a CPA, you have to have a graduate degree in addition to passing a series of four intense exams. I would fall asleep quite often during classes, but I still did well somehow, so I didn't think it was any more than what college kids do. 
I applied and was accepted into the Master's in Accounting program at Northeastern in Boston, Massachusetts. And it wasn't until grad school that I ever thought my sleepiness could be abnormal. We went out one evening after one of our last classes before graduation, as shown in the photo on the left. And we're all sitting at a table at Connor Larkin's Grill and Tap, which is pictured on the right. And one of my classmates, he put his arm around me and said, you know, Amy's a really cool girl. It's too bad that we can never talk to her because she's always sleeping. And it was at that moment that it hit me. I was sleeping constantly and I was always tired. Maybe this isn't normal. I consulted with my primary care doctor and we decided that I should reach out to a local sleep lab and schedule a sleep study to look for a possible disorder. Dr. Hammond did a good job talking about this earlier, but sleep studies are done by going into a lab where they hook you up to lots of wires to monitor your breathing, brain waves, heart rate, et cetera, to look for various things like sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and narcolepsy. My first sleep study was a polysomnogram, which is an overnight study. My results seemed normal and didn't show any breathing problems related to sleep apnea, so I returned to the sleep lab for a second sleep study to see if we could find out why I was sleepy. This time, a 24-hour study, mainly used to diagnose or rule out narcolepsy. This consisted of the nighttime portion again, but then also a daytime portion called a multiple sleep latency test with five nap opportunities. And for a narcolepsy diagnosis, they're looking for how quickly you go to sleep and how quickly you go into REM sleep. This was a crazy test for me. I didn't think I fell asleep for any of my naps, but it turned out that not only did I fall asleep, but I was also pretty quickly falling asleep for all five of them. And as a result of this, I was diagnosed with probable narcolepsy type two, narcolepsy without cataplexy at age 22. After experiencing this since at least high school, here I was in grad school, finally putting the pieces together and figuring out what was going on with me. The fact that the word probable was included in my diagnosis made me feel a bit uncertain. But at that point, I learned that narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder that impairs the brain's ability to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. It affects one in 2,000 people, which is 200,000 Americans and 3 million people worldwide. Excessive daytime sleepiness was the symptom that resonated the most with me but here are all of the symptoms, which Dr. Hammond also did a really great job, but I'll go through them in case anyone wasn't here earlier. Um, excessive daytime sleepiness, which is periods of extreme sleepiness during the day that feel comparable to how someone without narcolepsy would feel after staying awake for 48 to 72 hours. Cataplexy, which is striking sudden episodes of muscle weakness, usually triggered by strong emotions such as laughter, exhilaration, surprise, or anger. The severity may vary from a slackening of the jaw or buckling of the knees to falling down. And the duration may be for a few seconds to several minutes. The person remains fully conscious, even if unable to speak during the episode. Hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, which are visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations upon falling asleep or waking up. And these can be really frightening and confusing. Sleep paralysis, which is the inability to move for a few seconds or minutes upon falling asleep or waking up. It's usually accompanied by the hallucin hallucinations, and sleep paralysis is something that I have experienced as well. And lastly, disrupted nighttime sleep. Unlike public perceptions, people with narcolepsy do not sleep all the time. The sleep timing of sleepiness is off with narcolepsy, so one may fight sleepiness during the day but struggle to sleep at night. There are two forms of narcolepsy, narcolepsy with cataplexy and narcolepsy without cataplexy. Recent research suggests that narcolepsy with cataplexy is caused by a lack of hypocretin, a key neurotransmitter that helps sustain alertness and regulate the sleep-wake cycle. But less is known about narcolepsy without cataplexy. As I mentioned, I was diagnosed with type two narcolepsy without cataplexy. 
I was told by my doctor that I didn't quite fit the profile of someone who has narcolepsy without cataplexy, but my results were abnormal and they needed to diagnose me with something in order to prescribe any treatment. My doctor was unwilling to explore what I might actually have, so I decided to take the matter into my own hands. I saw several sleep doctors and neurologists over the next few years, and none of them were able to give me any answers. Right around the time of my diagnosis, wearable activity trackers were starting to become popular. So I got a Fitbit in order to try to automate tracking my general health activity, and most importantly for me, my sleep schedule. One thing my doctors always asked me to do was keep a manual sleep diary, asking me to write down what time I went to bed, if I woke up during the night, and if and when I napped during the day. This was a laughable request to me. I had no idea exactly what time I went to bed or woke up, and the Fitbit gave me the ability to effortlessly hand over my data to my doctors in the form of an Excel spreadsheet. In addition to my Fitbit, I recently got a sleep number smart bed, which I'm excited about as another data source. I ended up turning to the internet for help in 2014, and my research led me to find the term idiopathic hypersomnia, which is a chronic neurological disorder, chronic neurological disorder marked by an insatiable need to sleep that's not eased by a full night's slumber. Excessive daytime sleepiness, which as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't able to stay awake um, in the daytime grad school classes. And people with idiopathic hypersomnia sleep normal or long amounts of time each night, but still feel excessively sleepy during the day, which is the case for me. I sleep about eight to 10 hours each night on average, and yet still don't feel truly awake during the day. They may take long naps, but wake up feeling no better or worse than um, when they woke up. And other symptoms include sleep inertia or sleep drunkenness, which is a transitional state after waking with a desire to return to sleep, feeling foggy and automatic behaviors. This symptom was very disruptive for me. I'd set 10 alarms every morning and still sleep through all of them, having turned them off with no memory of it. And then disrupted nighttime sleep, which I did not experience. Sometimes I have trouble falling asleep, but once I'm asleep, I usually stay asleep. These symptoms seem to describe exactly what I was experiencing. And solidifying my hypothesis even more, the Wikipedia page mentioned that a recent study had shown that Raynaud syndrome was significantly more common in people with hypersomnia. My understanding and experience with Raynaud's is that it's a non-life-threatening disorder where your fingers and toes turn white, blue, and then red due to the blood vessels narrowing when you're cold or feeling stressed. Of course, Raynaud's has no known cause or cure either, and I had been just diagnosed with it separately and didn't think it could be related to my sleep disorder until then. I learned that Emory University was a world-renowned leading center in the diagnosis, treatment, and research of hypersomnia. So I called and scheduled an appointment at Embry. They were, and still have, ongoing research collecting the spinal fluid and blood of sleepy people and testing it to see if an unnamed chemical that acts like Valium is elevated. I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and got a lumbar puncture or smile tap on my 25th birthday. When telling friends and family about this experience, one of them asked me if I had a cake. And I'm sure that I did, but believe it or not, I was more excited for this procedure and the prospect of what could come from it. For me, there wasn't any better birthday present than that. I had my mother and my boyfriend by my side supporting me as well. I try to bring both of them to all of my neurology appointments because, well, it's a neurology appointment and I'm not always self-aware enough to be able to communicate how I'm doing. And also, having them hear everything straight from the doctor's mouth removes the burden of having to try to explain what's going on with me to my family. The results from the lumbar puncture confirmed a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. And this was a huge relief because this diagnosis seemed like a better fit for what I was experiencing. 
Idiopathic hypersomnia is believed to affect one in 20,000 people, which is about 10 times rarer than narcolepsy. On the other hand, although I finally felt like I had a correct diagnosis, there still were no approved treatments at the time. In 2021, the FDA approved one nighttime medication for IH and narcolepsy medications are also used. Nighttime and histamine directed medications can be used to decrease excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy for narcolepsy type one. Wake promoters or stimulants can be used to increase alertness and IH can also be treated with GABA directed medications. This last one here stands out for me. There is a GABA-A receptor antagonist, which is approved by the FDA for IV use in hospitals to reverse the actions of benzodiazepines such as Valium. And in the instance of patients with hypersomnia, it's being used as an investigative treatment in an off-label way to compete with a presumed naturally occurring chemical in the body that acts very much like Valium. Such a treatment is 180 degrees from other FDA approved medications meant to treat narcolepsy, which act to promote wakefulness by enhancing brain chemistry that promotes wakefulness. Whereas this is promoting wakefulness by sort of neutralizing the tendency to be sleepy. And for me, this GABA-A receptor antagonist was life-changing. It's a compounded cream that I rubbed on my arms and it helped me wake up in the morning. This was huge. I still didn't like waking up in the morning, but then again, I haven't met many people who do. The difference is that when I put it on, I can wake up in the morning. My alarm would go off, and I'd still want to snooze it, but the fact is I would, I would hear it, and I would actually wake up. Whereas before, I would sleep through anything and everything. It essentially cured my sleep inertia. Also, coping strategies vary by person, but may include Social support, such as meetup groups or social media, and improvement in general health and wellness through sleep hygiene, diet, and fitness. Here's a chart of the symptoms of narcolepsy and hypersomnia, which highlights the differences. As you can see, all have excessive daytime sleepiness. Only narcolepsy type one has cataplexy, and idiopathic hypersomnia has a hallmark system, symptom of sleep drunkenness or sleep inertia which is only experienced in narcolepsy some of the time. Also, I talked about disrupted nighttime sleep as a symptom of IH on my previous slide, although it's marked as only a symptom of narcolepsy here. Different sources sometimes include it and sometimes don't. This chart was created by the Hypersomnia Foundation and is available online at hypersomniafoundation.org if you'd like to take a closer look. I'm thankful that I can now call the boyfriend I mentioned earlier, my husband. We've been through a lot, and most of the difficulty has come from my illness. I was diagnosed not long before I met him, and um, I had just started trying treatments with limited effectiveness. He'd often get frustrated with me that I couldn't wake up on time for work in the morning, and he couldn't understand why, when he asked me to do simple things like get ready and take a shower, it was met with resistance. Diagnosis and education about hypersomnia has helped us both understand and address things in a positive way. From my husband Evan's perspective, it's helped him in terms of patience and understanding because he understands that most of my behaviors are not intentionally directed at him. I've also learned to better communicate my needs, making it easier to be supportive, but I do still struggle with trying to balance having my needs met and feeling like a burden to the family, and at the same time, living even still today in a little bit of denial about the impact of having IH. As far as my lifestyle goes, um, in social life, I've stopped burning the candle at both ends, trying to function like everyone else while struggling to remain wakeful. I no longer commit to doing things early in the morning uh, before 8 a.m is inconsistent for me and really not possible for me to guarantee that I'll be there. And I've learned that committing to doing things before 8 a.m. puts me at risk of letting people down. I also no longer feel bad about leaving a party early because I'm sleepy and want to go to bed or declining an invite to go see a movie which will likely be in a dark theater where I might fall asleep and miss the show. 
I pretty much try to do things in the middle of the day and avoid mornings and evenings. For my career, I started as an auditor at an accounting firm, which was an incredibly demanding job. After my diagnosis, I stopped taking the CPA exam and trying to be a star auditor and pursued an accounting role in a company that supports one of the things that I love, which is traveling. Once I was in, I started experimenting with different departments and finally landed a role on the SEO team, optimizing search engine results after a few years of trying. It was a bit terrifying to make this transition, but I'm glad I did, and it was incredibly rewarding to finally be in a role where I could do more of what I love, like designing experiments to test user behavior theories. I made this transition in part because I needed my work to be more fulfilling since uh, working full time and needing to sleep so much, I really didn't have much time for hobbies outside of work. Working for a travel website also allowed me flexibility to work from anywhere and I secured working from home every Friday, along with flexibility and hours, as long as I got my work done. I was impacted by cost-cutting layoffs in 2020, which ended my seven years with the company. My husband and I decided to take the opportunity to start a family, and our baby girl was born in February 2021. This was a huge decision, because I knew I would have to stop taking all of the IH medications I was currently on, and I didn't know how it was going to impact my quality of life. I would like to point out that it took getting laid off from my job and a pandemic for me to seriously consider having a baby. My company gave decent severance, so I felt that I'd be financially secure. And with the social expectation being to stay home due to COVID, I felt comfortable that if I was bedridden, it would be acceptable. My neurologist basically said she wouldn't want me to continue taking my IH medications during pregnancy, so there was a high chance that while I was pregnant, my IH symptoms would worsen, and I may need to apply for long-term disability because the first trimester can be the most difficult. So it was likely that I wouldn't be able to work for the nine months of pregnancy, plus I would still need maternity leave after the baby was born. Fortunately for me, this was not the case. By some miracle, the opposite happened and my IH symptoms seemed to disappear as soon as we conceived. Now, it's already difficult for me to relate to people because of living with a chronic illness, especially with small talk. And people would come up to me and say things like, oh, you must be so tired, I was exhausted during my pregnancy. <laughs> and I would agree out of politeness to most people, but in reality, I was like, this is the most awake I've ever felt in my life. Imagine that, the time that most women describe as the most exhausted they have ever felt is the most awake I have ever felt. I did feel tired while I was pregnant, but it was nothing compared to the excessive daytime sleepiness and sleep inertia that are idiopathic hypersomnia. The relief that I felt from my symptoms during pregnancy gives me hope that we can find some way to replicate it with medication because the other option is to be pregnant all the time and I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I also chose to breastfeed and to continue to breastfeed in the second year as recommended by the World Health Organization and American Academy of Pediatrics. This meant that I would remain untreated until um, she was fully weaned. It wasn't ideal since my excessive daytime sleepiness returned at about one year postpartum. And I feel like I could be a better mother and wife if there were a treatment that could give me more wakeful hours each day. But my husband and I made it work. The current treatment options just weren't effective enough for me to want to forgo the benefits of breastfeeding. In November 2022, I stopped breastfeeding so that I could start trying new treatments. I'm feeling especially determined now that I've experienced relief from my excessive daytime sleepiness so recently, and I'm not willing to settle for my old treatment of stimulants. At this point, it's been over 10 years since diagnosis, and so much has changed in my life that I feel like I need to start from scratch and reassess what the best treatment is for me and what's even effective now. 
One of the things that I was most afraid of was not being able to care for my baby at night and not waking up when she cried. And my sleep inertia is the one symptom that has completely disappeared and is still gone today, almost three years later. Not only do I wake up when she cries, I even wake up when she's just rolling over or tossing and turning on the monitor. And I hope that pregnancy has changed my brain forever in this way. As a family, we decided that I would stay home with the baby and I started working part-time from home as the CFO of the Hypersomnia Foundation in January 2022. I would not be able to go back to work full-time without an effective treatment, even from home or with accommodations. I was a member of the Board of Directors of the Hypersomnia Foundation from 2017 to 2020, and I'm proud to be back as the CFO. And I plan to continue to be an advocate for people with idiopathic hypersomnia and related sleep disorders. Some examples here, the photo on the left is from the American School Counselors Association conference, which was in Boston in summer 2019. We attended and had a booth in order to raise awareness and encourage school counselors to investigate sleep disorders as a potential cause for sleepy students. The photo on the right is from a World Narcolepsy Day event in September 2022, also in Boston, which was hosted by Centessa. They brought in people with narcolepsy and IH in order to humanize their scientific research and also better understand the real life impacts of these central disorders of hypersomnolence. Because of low awareness, even among physicians, and misperceptions, eight to 15 year delays between narcolepsy symptom onset and diagnosis are not uncommon. It's estimated that the majority of people are currently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, and common misdiagnoses include depression, epilepsy, and schizophrenia. I'm sharing my story with you today because I truly believe that these sleep disorder, disorders, IH, narcolepsy, et cetera, are not as rare as we might think but rather are just rarely diagnosed. And I wanna raise awareness with the general population as well as medical and scientific professionals. I prepared this presentation with Rising Voices, which is a program of the nonprofit organization Project Sleep, which empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of narcolepsy and other sleep disorders. Please take a moment to provide your feedback on this presentation by following the QR code to a brief survey. These surveys are a tool to measure the impact of the advocacy and awareness efforts, which can be a tricky thing to measure and your participation is greatly appreciated. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have a couple of questions um, for you. The first is anonymous online, and it says, how to deal with unsupportive family members who are convinced you're, quote, just lazy. They acknowledge my IH diagnosis, but ironically, you won't acknowledge the symptoms and how it impacts my everyday life. It has ruined my relationship with my parents and the rest of my family. Have you got any comments on that? Because oh. you did talk quite, quite a lot about your supportive family. Yeah, that's really tough. I'm sorry that whoever that is going through that, um, I think my advice would be if they're willing to have a conversation with other supporters. I think having um, them like talk to other people that are in a similar situation mm -hmm. as them can be really, really helpful mm -hmm. in understanding what's you know, going on. Mm -hmm. The idea that I have is... Um, I'll just give you the microphone, Hannah. <laughs> okay. An idea to kind of add on to that is, like you said, you always have your mom and your now husband go with you, that they're supportive, but maybe seeing if, even though they're not as supportive as that, like seeing if they're able to go to be able to kind of get it from the doctors themselves to not have it feel like, because I feel like when I try to explain to either my boyfriend or my parents or friends or anything like that, like it comes across as, across as, oh, it's just an excuse, whereas if they go with you to the doctor, then they might have the, it's from a doctor. I kind of believe it a little bit more. 
Yes, exactly. I don't know what the psychology is behind it, but I think that hearing it from someone else other than, than you, it makes a big difference, like hearing it from a doctor or from another parent, supporter, definitely. Thank you. I have a question, Amy. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned the Fitbit and sleep yeah. tracking devices. Can you say a little bit more about that and how that's um, been beneficial to you? Um, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, it was just, I, I don't think I could provide accurate data on my own without having something do it for me. And um, just being able to look at, like, my sleep and understand, like, okay, yeah, like, yeah, I did actually get a good night's sleep last night, and I'm still waking up and I'm tired. Um, and just kind of having that validation and, and being able to hand, hand that over so that it can be looked at. You know, of course, there are nights that I you know, stay up too late and that's different, but like just being able to, to monitor that on my own without having to go and have another sleep study um, is just really important to me to have, to have that data, to have that concrete um, objective data there um, because so much of the diagnosis is, is subjective and kind of asking like, how are you feeling? What, like, how do you think this is impacting you? And something to kind of add on, more of a statement to her question to you, is that a lot of people don't have the finances to be able to get a Fitbit or a smartwatch or something like that to track it. But it's something that I found out from work uh, actually recently because I've been wanting to get one to help track that, is that if you, get a if you have a full-time job and company with benefits and all that, you can get a doctor from, or a prescription from your doctor for uh, some kind of smartwatch, Fitbit, whatever, then you can actually use your HSA to be able to purchase it and reimburse yourself with that. Yeah, that's, like, that's how I got my first one too. Was, um, through my company, they had a um, you know, health reimbursement benefit. Thank you, that's excellent. GABA A or GABA B deficiency or excessive? Which one was in your spinal fluid? Oh, ah, I don't know. I can find out for you. <laughs> And also, are you telling me that uh, topical um, flumazine, uh, right? Yes. So was uh, less beneficial than pregnancy? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I am saying that. And so the GABA A receptor antagonist that I was talking about is called flumazenil. Um, I put it on my arms, rubbed it on my arms before bed, and it just helped me wake up in the morning. And um, on, I would say they're, they're equal effectiveness. How many times a day would you have to do that? I only did it before bed. That was it? Mm -hmm. um, which was not what I was prescribed. And how <laughs> did you find a pharmacy to compound that? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a pharmacy in Atlanta. I think they're still doing it called Pavilion. Um, and I think they're the main resource. I happen to um, have a mother that owned a pharmacy, a compounding pharmacy, and um, <laughs> that's how I got it locally. <laughs> um, there were some additional comments online. Other women had experienced the same relief in symptoms during pregnancy. Okay, any more? Are there any other GABA A? receptor antagonist, I think I said that right, medications that you've tried other than that one? I don't know spe specifically. Um, I know that um, there are other GABA-directed medicines, um, which chlorothromycin is one of those. Um, I don't know if there are any other specific GABA-A receptor antagonists. Can you answer that one, Dr. Hammond? Well, there, there's many uh, inhibitors and agonists, antagonists, but no, notoriously, famazenil is the one that we use in hospitals, emergency rooms, to reverse the effects of benzodiazepines. Um, and so that one is the most understood. It's only IV, as you pointed out, IV preparation, not available here in the United States otherwise, with the exception of a few compounding pharmacies I'm going to have to get a name for. Um, we have, you know, many, many GABAergic therapies that essentially are agonists of GABA, the, the GABA pathways. Uh, so we have a plethora of those, but the only one that's been shown a benefit is essentially uh, the oxabate therapy, uh, utilizing that pathway. Although, again, the mechanisms is unclear. 
Yeah, I guess I'd just like to add that um, flumazenil is, is being used like kind of as a, a last line defense only if you've like failed other treatments because there aren't any studies on it. Okay, we have a question from Cheryl that says, do you know if Emory will evaluate you or update a diagnosis for treatment virtually with Medicare insurance if you can't afford to travel there? My guess is no. Um, I think they like to see you, but... Right. Um, I think that's a question for... Yeah, I don't know the <laughs> answer. Okay. Um, Actually, I'd like you, if you've got a moment, to explain the Rising Voices program a little bit more and if there's anyone in our audience who would be interested in knowing more about it and how do they apply? Uh, yes, I think that applications are still open. I might be lying, but for... Okay, applications are still open. If you go to projectsleep.com, um, you can find them. Um, and it's a really wonderful program and community where um, Project Sleep will guide you through putting putting your story together, and and you get feedback from um, everyone who's participated in the program already. Um, so you can you know build your confidence before sharing it, and um, it's just I, I highly recommend it. Um, and you're just kind of committing to to doing some some advocacy work wherever you can find it. Um, Calling up a you know local university that's got a, a sleep program and an offering to um, present to them or presenting to the pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. or um, whatever you can find uh, you are you are committing to to trying to do some some events but it's it's been a really wonderful experience and everyone has welcomed me with with open arms everywhere that I've been. Mm -hmm. So. Um Natalia is asking, during your journey, have you met nurses that have IH? Oh. Or doctors. Um, well, I guess I have. <laughs> um, and mostly, though, doctors that, um, you know, get involved because they, they have a, a loved one that has right. IH, yeah. so. And do you mind repeating the name of the cream that you put on your arm? Flumazenil. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amy.